Welcome to Lake Tuxway United Methodist Church and this service of worship. It is good to see uh, some of you for the very first time in worship with us and also familiar faces that have uh, returned to be with us. It is a delight to have you. Uh, I don't have any announcements other than what <clears throat> you see on the back of the bulletin, so you can read those and um, I think that is sufficient. Does anyone else have an announcement you want to make? If not, the reason we have gathered is to worship a risen Lord, so will you please stand as we share in the greeting. Let us praise God who meets our needs and leads us to places of tranquility and rest. Let us praise God who comforts us and replaces our fears with overflowing love. Our hymn of praise is hymn number 308. be seated and will you join me as uh, together we pray the opening prayer shepherd God we praise you for enfolding us in your great love we rejoice in the knowledge that your care for us is so great that we lack nothing you provide for all our needs even the strength to cope in times of darkness and distress. The depth of your care for us is revealed in the person of Jesus, who was prepared to go to the cross to prove that your goodness and mercy is more powerful than evil and death. In response to these many blessings, we have gathered together in this, your house, praying that this time of worship will be a fitting response to the many blessings we receive from you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You have the appointed scripture passages in the bulletin. I invite you to follow along if you are a visual learner or if you uh, prefer to listen, that is uh, acceptable as well. The first lesson throughout the season of Easter is from the book of Acts. And today's uh, lesson is kind of, it starts mid-act, if you will. What has preceded this is that Peter and John had uh, were on the way to cure a uh, were on the way to the temple to pray, and it was at the time in the afternoon when uh, offerings, sacrifice offerings, were made. And as they were making their way, they were stopped by an individual who was uh, afflicted, and he was cured. And so we pick the story up as uh, on the next day, really, when. Peter and John are questioned about what they had done and how they had done it. So that is some background to the story. Now the next day, the leaders, elders, and legal experts gathered in Jerusalem along with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others from the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and asked, By what power or in what name did you do this? Then Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, answered, Leaders of the people and elders, Are we being examined today because something good was done for a sick person? A good deed that healed him? If so, then you and all the people of Israel need to know that this man stands healthy before you because of the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. He has become the cornerstone. And salvation can be found in no one else. Throughout the whole world, no other name has been given among humans through which we must be saved. Here ends the reading of the uh, lesson from Acts. Um, for the Psalter lesson this morning, we're going to sing it. So I'm going to invite you to turn in your hymnals to page 136. It's the familiar Cremens tune. And so we will sing our Psalter lesson on page 136. <laughs>
epistle lesson comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. Um, John exhorts the Christian community to love one another and reminds them that this love is rooted in the love of Jesus for his disciples. This is how we know love. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But if a person has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, and that person doesn't care, how can the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and reassure our hearts in God's presence. Even if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence in relationship to God. We receive whatever we ask from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love each other as he commanded us. The person who keeps his commandments remains in God, and God remains in him. And this is how we know that he remains in us because of the spirit that he has given to us. Here ends the reading of the epistle lesson. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? The gospel is from John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. We go back way before Jesus' um, death, burial, and resurrection. But this is the fourth Sunday of Easter, and always in the fourth Sunday of Easter, we observe what is known as Good Shepherd Sunday. And so we have this reading where Jesus refers to himself as, I am the Good Shepherd. And I believe, yes, it's the one I kneel on, uh, or close to it, one of our kneelers we have the I am statements from the Gospel of John on our kneelers, and here it is, I am the Good Shepherd. Hear this lesson. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, and when the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. That's because he isn't the shepherd. The sheep aren't really his. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. He's only a hired hand, and the sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I give up my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that don't belong to this sheep pen. I must lead them too. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me. I give up my life so that I can take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I give it up because I want to. I have the right to give it up, and I have the right to take it up again. And I receive this commandment from my Father. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Remain standing and we will sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 452.
Please be seated. And I direct your attention again to the bulletin. And we have the privilege, as we know, always and everywhere to make confession to God. In fact, the hymn that we just sang in many ways was a prayer of confession. But we also uh, recognize that individually and corporately uh, it is fitting in worship to offer confession and to seek forgiveness. So I invite you that we will be praying responsively uh, this prayer of confession. Will you join with me as we direct our hearts to examination both personally and communally? As we remember the love that will not let us go, we remember with shame the times we have not reflected the depth of love in and through our, love, our lives. God of steadfast love, forgive us in loving and unloving actions and words. God of unchanging love, as this community of faith, we confess the times when our love for the world falls short of your love for us. God of unlimited love, forgive us. Merciful and loving God, help us to empty ourselves of all that hinders your life-giving love to shine through our lives. Strengthen us with your spirit credible witnesses of your love as we experience it in and through Jesus, your Son, our Savior and love. Amen. And hear these words uh, of assurance of our forgiveness. God, who is rich in mercy, out of great love for us, even when we were dead through our sins, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God. And so I declare to you, in Christ Jesus, we are loved and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh, it's the fourth Sunday of Easter. And it's always, as I have said to you, Good Shepherd Sunday. In fact, I went back um, this week and looked on my hard drive um, for the sermons that I have preached over the years. Uh, and to be honest with you, I almost used last, sun last year's sermon because um, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> but then I thought, somebody out there will remember it. Um, for me, it's a little bit difficult sometimes with texts that are so familiar to people and to me to think about them in a fresh way, especially texts that are so thick with multiple layers. And we've heard two of the most familiar and cherished portions of scripture, the 23rd Psalm. Most of you, I would suspect, can quote it from memory. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you know, if I were to have kept account of the number of times I have read that passage of scripture in public worship, in private worship, and especially at funerals, it would be significant. And then we have this section of scripture from John's Gospel where John says, I am the good shepherd. And it's rich because it comes from those sayings in John. I mean, John and his gospel is so full of layers. There are the I am statements, 
You want to know a few of them in case you've forgotten them? I am the resurrection, the life, the truth, and the way. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. There's seven of them, most theologians say. And then John's Gospel also has signs. You know, some of you who studied it, you know that, right? Please shake your head and tell me, yes, you know that. So there's the signs. I mean, John's Gospel is full of meaning. And then we all have these childhood memories and stories around particularly these two passages of Scripture. Last year's sermon, I told you about the church that I attended in Durham. And I have to tell you that those years in Durham and that um, church influenced who I am and influenced what I understand about worship in so many ways. The minister there understood that worship was not about people. He understood that worship was always directed to God. I quote from him frequently when he says, Worship is not to tickle people's noses, it is to tickle the nose of God. And he got irritated when people would want worship to be pleasing and satisfactory to them. He said, yes, worship should be the best it can be, but it should always be because it's directed to God, not at humanity. But I also remember that every Sunday when I would leave that church in the sanctuary, you've been in those kind of gothic structures where the inside of the sanctuary is like an inverted boat and the trusses that are there, you know, some of you Episcopalians especially know that. And that church had beautiful stained glass windows, but when you left and would exit the narthex, as you left and turned around to leave, the largest stained glass window was over the balcony. You never saw it during worship. You saw it as you left. And there in that largest stained glass window, window over the balcony was a rendition of Jesus and under it it had I am the good shepherd. It also had, you know, in memory of somebody too. But Jesus was carrying a lamb and leading sheep. And all of you have grown up with churches where you've seen stained glass depictions of these stories. You've grown up with stories. You've grown up with uh, poetry all about Jesus as the shepherd. And so you, I hope, can understand not only the layers of meaning in the scripture, but then the layers of experience we all bring to these texts that I might find it a little difficult and have some fear and trepidation about what I could say that would be meaning. But still, in my reading these words this week, over and over and over, especially looking at the gospel lesson, I am the good shepherd. It seems almost a little irreverent, so I hope you won't hear it as irreverent, but it was a question I kind of started formulating in my own mind and saying, you know, nobody ever talks about this. But why is it, there's a question, just a simple question I asked, why is it that we have shepherds? And why do shepherds have sheep in the first place? And the story in John's Gospel tells us about the hired hand who runs away when there's danger. But the shepherd stays. So why do shepherds have sheep? Have you ever thought about that? Probably not. Shepherds keep sheep for pretty much the same reason that ranchers keep cows. And pretty much the same reason that cotton farmers plant cotton seed. And that, I'm being funny now, and that the colonel kept chickens. (laughs) 
being a shepherd and taking care of sheep and being a sheep and having a shepherd are sooner or later going to have something to do with wool and with mutton. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> I'm glad somebody sees my humor in that. There's just no avoiding it. And this little reality never shows up in the stained glass windows that we depict of Jesus as the Good Shepherd or of Psalm 23 or in our greeting cards where we have, you know, how many of us have sent greeting cards to someone who's grieving with Psalm 23 written in it, especially that, and though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I mean, we've sent those, right? You have? But keep those two things in mind with me. Will and mutton. Because in a sense, that's kind of encouraging. After all, one of the problems with the sheep and shepherd, or shepherd and sheep business perhaps, as popular as it is, is that I have preached and have read that sheep are usually depicted as rather passive, stupid, unimaginative, docile, and dull. And so if I'm a sheep in the Lord's pasture, does that mean if I'm to be like sheep, I'm just to hang around as a dumb, docile, occasionally getting lost for the shepherd to come find me, not doing much, and I can't do this, but to try to look as cute as I can as a little sheep? <laughs> No, you really laughed at that because there's no way. I mean, I'm trying to survive on my own for 15 minutes? Is the whole point of the story that we aren't worth very much and that we aren't very capable? No. Remember, shepherds didn't keep sheep as pets. There were reasons for the whole enterprise and expectations for all concerned. The sheep are important. They are necessary. And that brings us back to the business of wool and mutton. It's the piece that the good shepherd business is all about. It's about our part of what's going on with this familiar and comfortable talk about green pastures and still waters. The Lord expects things of us. And if we don't come through, Are there contingency plans? We have to be careful. And we have to keep things straight. The point is not that there's some fine print on Jesus' promise to be the good shepherd. Or that he's only a shepherd for the most useful sheep. Jesus isn't going to leave any of us to the wolves or turn us into dog food or whatever is done with worthless sheep if we don't produce. The Lord cares for us and has blessed us. He has laid down his life for us. That sacrifice, that love, that continued care, those are the gifts of God in Christ. And they're given without condition and exception. 
We don't have to try to do stuff in the hope that God will be nicer to us or love us more. Indeed, as I looked at these texts and was reading some about one of the commentators talking about God's love, the commentator says, there is no more love than Christ laying down his life for us. But nonetheless, even though we don't do anything to earn that, to get more of it, because there is no more, nonetheless, there, is, there are expectations of us. And in my, I hope you don't see it as irreverent, but in my trying to look at these texts in a new way, that's where we get down to the business of wool and mutton. The care that God has offered us is intended to lead us to something real and substantial. We're to be productive. Not in the sense of our American idea, but we are to be productive in the sense of God's kingdom, living faithful lives. From our various circumstances, our various situations, our various skills, our various abilities, our resources, our gifts. I may be a sheep in God's pasture, but I don't produce wool. That's not of my nature. But it is of our nature to worship and to serve. To reach out and to share. To study and to pray. To increase in holiness and to bear the truth. By the way, if you were a Methodist, if any of you, and it fits, you know, we Methodists claim the Anglican heritage from, for those of you who are from Episcopal backgrounds, all this is Wesleyan theology I'm preaching right now. I mean, it is straight out of Wesley. I didn't copy it out of Wesley, but it's straight out of Wesley. It is our nature to be willing to sacrifice it's our nature to be willing to choose to grow in a disciplined and steady way into the fullness and stature of our shepherd, Jesus the Christ. We Wesleyans believe that every day we should be exemplifying Christ more fully. That each day is the doctrine of sanctification. We become more and more like Christ. And that we do it in the community with integrity. We worship, we serve. And I'm not talking really about, you know, the Sunday morning stuff. Yes, I'm glad you are here to worship in this place. I'm not talking about the committee stuff of the church. Although that is part of it. But instead, it's something even larger than that. A whole lot more interesting. And sometimes it costs. It can cost a lot sometimes. Remember once more the wool and the mutton. I've had the opportunity to see a sheep when they are shearing it and to see the sheep afterwards. No doubt in my mind that after the sheep has given up that coat of wool, they feel vulnerable. They feel that something has been lost. But they've given up something so that somebody can be warm at night. 
And in Jesus' day, it was very important. Don't forget that each and every one of us, yes, is a sheep in God's pasture, and we have worth and value. Each of us is important. Each of us belongs. For me, that understanding that I belong is so important to me. Perhaps some of you have other stories of your own lives where you have felt frequently that you didn't belong. And thanks be to God in Christ, it was the church, it is the church. This is where I know I belong. It's where I'm accepted for my faults and my strengths. It's where I know that people are just like me. We didn't do a thing to earn God's favor. It was all about God's grace. And that every one of us, regardless of our brokenness, regardless of our hurt, our sin, our past, brings something to the shepherd and to the fold of the herd. We're valuable assets. One of the things that I think our culture in particular forgets, particularly as it relates to theology, is that we aren't chosen for privilege. Not in the church at least. We are not chosen, picked out, protected by the Good Shepherd for the sake of our own comfort, our own convenience, our personal needs, or ease of life. The biblical record doesn't bear that out. The biblical record bears out that people are chosen Because God sees in them a gift that can be utilized in the kingdom of God. And it means they are special. Yes, Jesus is the good shepherd. He pays the price. He protects us and he cares for us. That is the way it is. But there's also much more than that. We are valuable and we are important. And we have an essential role to play in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. You see, there is this business, after all, of wool and mutton. When I leave church today, I plan to look up and imagine a stained glass window back there. But instead of seeing Jesus as my protector and my comforter, I know that. And sometimes I need to be reminded of that. I'm, a, I'm going to also see him as the one 
who leads me out of this place. Into the service that each of us is called to do in the kingdom of God. And I want to say to many of you, you do that in so many ways. So don't worry that I'm trying to preach to you something that I'm saying you're not doing it. You do. I would point out some of you, except it's not appropriate. But you do act in service to the Good Shepherd. You understand that you don't belong here in this safe, secure place forever. Yes, we dwell in the arms of Jesus. But right now, until Christ comes again, we belong in the world, being Christ's hands and feet, doing the business of ministry. And yes, folks, you know what? Probably not for most of us, but it might occasionally get us brought before some legal or theological powers. Just as Peter and John experienced in the story we read from Acts. Remember, you are loved, you belong, but the work is about serving Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. amen. We continue together in worship this morning as uh, I invite you to take up your hymnals, turn in the back to page number 881. And stand, we will affirm what it is we believe using this historic confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Please be seated. Here we go. I usually have a list of prayer concerns, and for a moment I'd lost them. We come to that time where we offer our concerns, and I share several uh, with you. Uh, new to our list this week, uh, Tamsin Freeman had surgery um, this week uh, at John Hopkins, and the report uh, initially is good with a good result, so we're thankful for that. Um, I received an email from her. I sent her an email with a prayer, and she sent back saying, I'm feeling better. I think I'm going to have a good result. Uh, so we pray for that. Um, and um, for she and Mark to be able to get up here soon um, to their summer uh, home. We also, um, many of you have already learned about the death of Rick Dobbins' mother. 
um, Rick and uh, MJ, you know, live in um, Betty, and I, I, I prayed with Rick on the phone this week. I met with MJ, had prayer with her, and I said to her and to Rick, you know, if it, I'm sorry, but you live in Ed and Betty Joe Castle's house. That's just that's the way it is for me. And so, if you don't know them, that's who they are. They live in the house they the last house that Ed and Betty Joe built, and they really understand themselves as stewards of that garden there that uh, Betty Joe um, lovingly uh, started. Um, so it's it's nice. But Rick's mother was 95, uh, a Christian. Um, had been very active in uh, her church, and so tomorrow morning they will be taking her back to Florida where his father is buried and uh, celebrating her life. So uh, we're in prayer for Rick and MJ as um, they grieve, but as Rick said, she had a great life, lived to be 95, and um, um, enjoyed all the privileges that living to be 95 has with it. Um, also, we continue to pray for Rosie Cantor, Marty's sister-in-law, for Bill Minnick, who's uh, getting treatment weekly, for Sue Thomas, for John, for George Hester and Sue, for Pat Webb, for um, Elizabeth Dice and Kevin. Um, we also pray for... Um, Jeannie, um, it is Ryland Jones that we have been praying for. Also, um, we continue to pray for others who have uh, lost loved ones in this uh, winter season. And we also are praying for those of you who are coming back. Uh, some of you who are here opening up houses. I know that's a big job and a lot of work to open up a house and to... Um, settle in for the summer. So we're praying for those who are uh, making those trips back and forth to open up their summer homes as we look forward to that congregation uh, growing. Um, are there other prayer concerns that you would want to add? Yes? I spoke to George and Sue Hester this week. They're hoping to be here at the end of May. And I asked him how he's doing. He said he's doing great. He had two new moms. Yes, Bill. Davy had. Okay, thank you for letting me know that. Um, Davy and Jeanette, as you know, are uh, summer residents. Um, that may delay him getting here a little, may delay them somewhat. Um, yes, somebody else I saw. Thank you. Many of you are friends of his, and he had surgery. It's a little over a week now. Are there other concerns? Yes, Fred, I'm sorry. Stephanie Callahan, who is moving uh, permanently to Nebraska. But she will be back in a couple of weeks. Get her things together. It's sad, but a good thing. Uh, many of you know Stephanie and Jerry because they were very faithful in attendance here in worship. Stephanie suffered a very um, significant stroke that has altered her um, life in many ways, and yet she is uh, able to do many things. But uh, this will be a move that gets uh, them closer to family where there will be assistance. So, uh, But I'm sure it's not an easy thing to do either, uh, and so um, we certainly want to be in prayer for them. Has the house sold yet? So we want to pray that the house sells for them too because that would be very helpful. So we would pray, I would ask that we pray for, for that to happen. Anything else? As always, you are invited to join me at the altar as we bring these concerns to God.
Oh God, I kneel on an altar cushion that carries the statement, I am the Good Shepherd. We heard it from the Gospel of John this morning. And some of us who have come into this place and as we've tried to think of new ways to see your scripture and how we as sheep of your fold are to live and to be, some of us perhaps needed reassurance that you are the good shepherd. Certainly, the names that we have called out need reassurance that you are the Good Shepherd. Tamson, Elizabeth and Kevin, Bill and Sherry, Sue and John, George and Sue, Pat, Rosie and her family, Joanne, Davy, Stephanie, and Jerry, Ryland, Rick and MJ, and even other things, oh God, and other people that we didn't name out loud. If comfort and care is what we need to receive this day, may you offer it to us, and may we receive it, and may we recognize that even as you offer comfort and care, we also carry the privilege of service and ministry. Not because we have to, because we need to earn your love and your care and your favor, but because we are chosen, we are loved, we are accepted. Thank you for this beautiful day that we have already started to enjoy and that we will continue to enjoy. Thank you for eyes that are able to take in all the beauty of your creation. Give us spiritual eyes to take in the beauty of your love and grace in Jesus Christ and then give us hearts hands, minds to reach out and share that same love with others. It is in the name of Christ we pray and who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in worship as our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace and truth, in Jesus, light of the world, you have fulfilled your promise to be with us when we walk through the darkest valley. Our gratitude for this evidence of your love for the world is made visible in these our offerings. Bless them and us, we pray, as we seek to do what is pleasing to you through our worship, witness, and service made in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 377.
not the first time, but it's, uh, there are some first time visitors or those who have visited several times. Please stay and join us in the fellowship hall. Get to know us. We are glad you're here and hope that you might consider this being a place where you work, worship regularly. We read, knowing that the good shepherd goes before us and it is our good privilege to serve and follow him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Came up. Uh, open up. Yep. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Everything's the same here. We'll see you in. All right. Safe trip home and safe trip back. You're arranging this weather for us. You're welcome. It is so good to have y'all. I hope you'll visit. Thank you. I hope y'all will visit again. Oh, good. Great. Good morning. I'm glad. Are you here permanent back for good? You're not going back. You're here. He actually did that on spring break. Good morning. It is. How are y'all this morning? Good to see you. I hope y'all had a good weekend. When did when did you get up here? So you had rain yesterday, but that's a nice day to. That's right. Uh, our shepherd, you are. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Yes. That was a good one. Thank you, John. <laughs> keep, really, really good. Keep me informed about Mama and about you. I just had our friend Pat for three days. Did you? Yeah. So she's doing pretty well then. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we just yeah. work out. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate that. Sherry's still in Georgia. She come back. She's back. She's back. Good. Tell her I said hello. Good morning, Shar. Good to see. You. Oh, thank you. Get your hands off. No, don't. I love this woman. She is a miracle. And every time I see her, I just see miracle, Bill. Uh, and you should too, because you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at her; she's a miracle. I mean, really. What was it? Three years ago? That's like four. Years four. I can't believe it's been that long. Time is. Been long. Four. Good to see you. Have you been? I didn't say that. And um, work is going. I, I think they'll be done in a month. I, you know, we waited forever, but now that it's going, I think it'll be done. Good to see you. Actually, it it was worse. It's not as bad now. You'll sort of miss the open blue. Do you have a blue tarp over the house? No, now the roof is back on. And um, the drywall person will be there this week. Um, they've reconnected the heat pump on our top floor. Um, and, and we have a fifth bedroom that Kim's dad spends the winter in. So when he left, that really freed us all up. 
and it's fortunate the house has three living areas so one of our living areas is closed down but there's one that's a kids playroom they jeremy's sleeping in it right now but it's worked out and, no maggie's the Maggie, eldest she is she's a senior she's a senior, senior. where's she going virginia tech oh. architecture oh. Gonna be a hokey. <laughs> she is gonna be a hokey and do you know what a hokey is it's a turkey, right? No, it's a fan of Virginia Tech, and the turkey happens to be the turkey happens to be a fan of Virginia Tech. <laughs> Is that not great? <laughs> um, actually, she's pretty excited. Um, and there was a lot of gnashing and um, cutting of teeth over that decision. Presenting another sermon. Pardon me. Turn your speaker off. You're, you're presenting another sermon. I am. Yeah, people are standing around. They're waiting for collection. There you go. There you go. No.